All right. A uh, very good evening to everybody. Um, so this is, uh, uh, despite the name, uh, as you can see with the name, uh, this is neither a tech talk nor, nor an innovation uh, session. Um, we are uh, simply carrying out a series of sessions primarily to uh, enlighten you all on the on the on the uh, on things that that matters to the industry that we are in uh, namely the food services industry uh, the reason that i chose this uh, topic uh, is because um, there's a huge influence uh, on the on, on the industry that we are in from this larger uh, economy uh, Uh, do, do not get carried away by the, the charts and stuff like that. I'm not going to like go into any, any technical details of, of uh, economics. No, I'm, I'm even talking about any numbers. I will simply show you some graphs just to, uh, just to understand some patterns. That's about it. What is economics? Uh, so it's, uh, before we proceed with the, with the rest of the session, it's important to understand what is economics means. Economics is simply uh, about efficiently uh, allocating the resources uh, which are which are scarce i mean we don't have resources in abundance it could be people it could be any resource I mean, it's an, um, natural resources um, oil you name it i mean we don't have uh, an infinite number of resources so we have a finite pool of resources so it's all about efficiently allocating uh, uh, these scarce resources including people economics have two branches macroeconomics and uh, microeconomics macro is all about uh, dealing with larger contexts you know if you if you talk about sri lanka if you talk about america if you talk about european union uh, asia those are macro level stuff uh, so the study of economics at that macro level is called macroeconomics microeconomics is all about studying sectors industries it could it could be the IT industry, uh, it could be the plantation sector. Likewise, you you narrow down into a, a smaller ch uh, smaller context. Uh, you can narrow it down all the way to an individual level. So you can actually study a person's behaviors, decisions that uh, buying decisions or, um, uh, or or economic decisions that they make uh, using these microeconomics uh, principles. Uh, if you just Google uh, for economics, uh, rest assured you will come across um, this uh, this kind of chart. This is called a demand and a supply graph. Uh, what's, what's, what you can take away from this is like this. This is called the equilibrium. This is where the demand meets supply, right? So, how how does this price gets determined? It's an amazing phenomenon because nobody sets that price, it happens um, um, automatically. So, uh, which we call, which, which we call uh, uh, that to be happening through something called the invisible hand. It does not exist, right? Uh, it's, uh, it just happens. Uh, think of it like, a, like a, let's say, uh, to dump it down, let's say, a pizza. How much? How much you like spend for like a large size pizza? It could be like thousand, thousand two hundred, in that range. Who determines that? Of course, the the company um, puts a price tag on that. But can the company sell it for let's like, say ten thousand? No, nobody will buy 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 that at, at that price. At least at least in this current uh, context. So I mean, determining that that right price where uh, where the the consumers can uh, the consumers are willing to pay. Is, 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 is it is happening through this mechanism, automatic mechanism, uh, which where we call it happening through this invisible hand. Um, so, I mean, anything that happens in, in, in our day-to-day -day lives, if you look at it, uh, this, is, this is happening even without us knowing. All right. Uh, then I want to introduce you to the concept uh, co uh, concept called the economic cycle. Uh, 
an economy uh, let's take sri lanka or, or let's take us by the way for for the entire duration of this presentation i'm actually focusing uh, on the us because uh, because that's our uh, primary market uh, that matters for us um, so any economy for that matter uh, goes through these these phases or so this cycle cycle um, you can think of it as four seasons of an economic uh, cycle uh, let me begin with this expansion. So what this means is that during the expansionary stage, an economy is, is actually accelerating, it's growing. So it's the gross domestic product, GDP. That's the measurement that we use for to like, you know, um, to um, uh, indicate the, the total value created within an uh, with, within a economy. Um, so during this uh, expansionary, expansionary stage, economy grows uh, and it grows and grows and it, it like peaks uh, at a point and here a market correction happens and then then it goes down uh, down again and which which we call a contraction uh, contraction uh, an economic contraction uh, in this stage uh, you can see in lower interest rates more spending by people more spending on restaurants, people go out, eat, watch movies, uh, uh, lots of uh, money spent on entertainment. Uh, but there's there's also inflationary pressure, as they call it, the, the inflation udamane. So I mean that the, the cost of living also like you know slowly accelerates, starts accelerating, and at at one point it, it peaks and then it starts going downwards. Uh, so this is where you like try to be more um, prudent in your spending. You slightly cut down on non-essential items. You only sp spend uh, money on the most essential stuff, likewise. Uh, um, so this is, this is the con contraction repeated. And then it, it uh, reaches the, the bottom. It bottoms out, uh, which we call the trough. Um, so this is like a valley. I mean, it, it's, it's the very bottom. So uh, even without you knowing, this cycle happens if, like you know, uh, every time, like all the time. So usually, uh, one of these economic cycles spans for uh, in US, it spans for about uh, between six to eight years. Uh, so any organization it could be Cisco Corporation, Cisco Labs is subjected to these economic cycles. So it, it's important for you to understand uh, that these economic cycles, these variations exist in the larger economy that we operate. Uh, uh, operating all the time. So we go through, we experience the, the impacts uh, of those in, um, cycles as well as our customers or as well as our suppliers or any other stakeholder. Um, it matters for CISO Labs because we have customers, direct customers. Uh, we sell um, uh, CISO solutions for uh, restaurants and or other uh, food service industry um, companies. And uh, and at the same time, we uh, work for Cisco, so where they also like provide uh, food supplies uh, for similar uh, establishments. Um, then I'd like to uh, folk, uh, present you uh, pr uh, present you two uh, examples of severe crisis in economic crisis that uh, crisis that happened the reason is that uh, do, uh, by looking at these we can learn a lot i mean these crises provides you uh, a lot of uh, lessons uh, to be learned um, and uh, so the the most recent one and one of the most severe ones was this 2007 2008 uh, financial crisis uh, what you see, this graph that you see is, is, is a, is a uh, stock market index called uh, S&P uh, 500. Uh, so here in this graph, you can see here, this is somewhere in 2008. Uh, I think it's somewhere in early 2008. So you can see it bottomed out that, that, that stock market crashed. Look at the severity of that crash. I mean, um, they lost billions and maybe trillions um, uh, uh, during day, within uh, weeks and months weeks and days, uh, and then it bottomed out at this stage. Um, and then you can see that it starts accelerating. So this is the expansion that I was talking about, and, and this was the trough. 
and and this was also uh, this is also an expansion peak it crashes rough likewise so it continues so if you if you focus on a small small area you can you can again see the same kind of like you know fluctuation fluctuation uh, this crisis uh, started off uh, uh, with a uh, uh, housing uh, housing market uh, collapse. Uh, what happened was uh, uh, it was named as the subprime mortgage cri crisis. Uh, you might have seen in papers and all uh, 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 something called a prime lending rate. Uh, there's a something called prime lending rate, right? So what that means is. Prime lending rate means uh, that's the uh, that's the interest rate that that's offered for um, uh, credit worthy people. I mean, who, who, whoever who has a good credit record, who, who some whoever who can pay uh, pay back uh, whatever the money borrowed uh, uh, gets that rate. Subprime means uh, that's the rate that's uh, subprime means uh, uh, giving giving out loans credit for those who does not have that credit level, which is more risky. So what happened in US was they started giving lending, uh, lending a credit to, to these uh, uh, risky uh, people. So they couldn't pay back uh, the loans that they took. Um, uh, with this, they, they took uh, lots of loans and, and borrowed houses, and but they couldn't pay back. That created a sort of a credit bubble, which eventually led to a ba uh, banking crisis. Uh, that is when the this Lehman Brothers failed, um, and uh, it then it all went south. So that was the the beginning of uh, this, this this crisis. It took nearly six years for them to like you know come come back to the same level. This is six years, uh, so it it was pretty pretty uh, severe. Um, one could wonder how how worse it could be in a recession. So this is a recession. So so this is called a recession. So when you have a, like a trough, you go through a recessionary period. That is a tough time in the economy. People are like tr struggling to find jobs. People get laid off and stuff like that. So how worse could it get? This is how how worse it could get. Uh, this is the Great Depression. This is called the uh, Great Depression because uh, uh, notice that uh, this is uh, this is a recession. It's called a Great Depression because yeah, the, the recession was prolonged. So uh, usually, technically speaking, a recession is any um, uh, negative growth uh, in the economy for about sub two subsequent quarters. But here, in this case, it, this lasted for like uh, 11 years. So the impact, the effects of that uh, recession was uh, felt. Uh, to various different countries at various different stages. So that's why we uh, say that this happened between these, this period. So it literally, it, uh, it literally has lasted for like uh, uh, ten, close to 10 years. Um, so you can see this is, uh, so the, in, the, in this graph, so uh, even economists and anybody who's like studies this, like uh, refers to this as the, the worst that could uh, happen and, and this is the worst I believe that has hap uh, that has happened uh, uh, in, in in the recorded history. Um, all right. So, what happened to the Cisco Corporation during this phase? So, this is the the, the stock market um, performance of uh, the Cisco. Uh, as you can see, you can see the same, like you know cyclical Im impact uh, on, on the Cisco, but it has survived. It has, it has come pretty strong. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make is, uh, the, 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 yes, the point that I'm trying to make is the, the economy is growing. I mean, the, the, the stock price is growing. I mean, this, this pattern is pretty um, common uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the larger economy as well. Um, the, the American economy is doing pretty well. Uh, according to the latest figures, uh, I think this, this same level of, uh, the same level of uh, pattern, that uptrend will, will continue to uh, happen. A uh, 
few key economic trends uh, for US for this year. Uh, there's a strengthening of the global demand. The, the, if you look at the, the macro economy of the, in the world, it's growing. It's growing at a, at a rate of about 4%. Four, 4%. That's, that's pretty good. So when there's global demand uh, for goods uh, uh, manufactured in the in US, and that's good. That's, that's good for US. So that means that, that the economy will like for further like uh, flourish. Uh, stabilizing oil prices. I know oil prices are like you know uh, having having you know there are ups and downs. I think there it's it's like uh, rising again. Uh, but largely speaking, uh, the, the oil prices are like you know uh, uh, um, serving well for the for the for the US uh, as a whole. Uh, believe it or not, uh, by 2016, U.S. was the largest. U.S. has have become the largest fuel exporter uh, in the world. Uh, a lot of people think like it's the Middle East, but U.S. have become the largest uh, exporter of fuel by 2016. I don't know the current picture, but uh, that was they achieved that in 2016. Uh, the Trump uh, Trump administration led tax reforms. Uh, uh, will actually push uh, push the economy a little further. Um, the corporate taxes were lowered from, I think, 35% to 21%. Uh, according to what I read, that will uh, leave about like 200 uh, plus billions of dollars with the consumers, with the people's at people's hands. So they will start spending. So we'll further like you know slightly push push the economy uh, a little further. So the trajectory, that upward trajectory, will. Uh, I will uh, move a little um, further. Uh, they are, as you know, uh, they had uh, natural calamities in East Texas uh, and, and Florida, so they are like, you know, coming out strong and they are recovering from those. Uh, this graph is, uh, uh, shows the unemployment rate. Uh, as you can see, the unemployment rate has, has, has gone down significantly. Uh, the horizontal line that you see here at, at the five percent is is called the full employment baseline. So if if you go e below below that, that means the economy has uh, achieved uh, what they call a full employment level. Um, I mean, when they say full employment, there still is a like a like a small percentage that will never uh, come to the uh, workforce. Uh, so. Um, but still, uh, this is uh, this is um, evidence enough uh, to say that this is this has reached full employment, uh, which is good. That means that uh, more more people are, are are in the workforce, and that means uh, more value is created. Uh, shifting uh, workforce demographics, uh, although uh, so month on month there's a new workforce joining. Like young people starts joining the, the, the work workforce, it has slowed down significantly, but the the demographics are changing. Meaning, more and more millennials are coming into the workforce. Uh, baby boomers have, have almost gone out uh, of the of the economy. Uh, Generation X and Generation Y. Generation X means uh, Generation Y means millennials. Those who have born uh, between 1980. And I believe 1994. Those are the millennials. So they are, I mean, they are somewhat in the economy right now. Uh, the 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 generation uh, before that, Generation X, is is in the economy. Likewise, it's shifting. The the, the demographics are shifting significantly, which matters a lot uh, for the business that we are in, which is the restaurant industry. From a consumer point of view, the consumer preferences, their tastes are like significantly getting shifted. Uh, however, that does not mean that we we should solely uh, uh, when I say we the restaurants should solely focus on these millennials. It's, it's not because Generation X uh, people are still uh, in the in the scene, and not only X, but even the even the baby boomers are like you know still in the in the consumption are consumers of of, of these restaurants. Uh, uh, remember, in the economic cycle, I, men I mentioned that in the in the, in the uptrend, there is uh, there that is when the people start spending uh, spending more uh, spending more on restaurants, uh, eating out, uh, spending more on entertainment. Uh, 
um, so all that is happening through something called this with this discretionary uh, discretionary uh, what do you call let's say capacity uh, consumers consumers discretionary capacity right discretionary means that uh, you can spend that at your discretion uh, uh, extra money you can think of it as extra money uh, so whenever you have an uptrend, you uh, you have more discretionary capacity. Uh, so you can spend on restaurants, fancy cars, uh, consumer durables, hotels, fancy watches, you name it. I mean, you, you, you start spending more. Uh, uh, like the economic cycle, this spending cycle is also cyclical. So between 1945 and 2009, we have uh, experienced 11 such economic cycles. So when you are building a company that, uh, that, is, that lasts a long period, for example, Cisco Corporation, so you have to weather through all these cycles. So you have to be resilient. Uh, similarly, it applies to uh, Cisco Labs as well. So we have to weather through these um, cycles in terms of empl employee, employment, um, preference, I mean, um, demographics, it changes, right? So, like I mentioned, uh, this, this, uh, this this consumer spending does really well when you are in an uptrend, but but re does really poorly uh, when you are uh, on a uh, on a contraction, economic contraction. Uh, in economy, when, when you are studying economies, uh, economics, uh, you you learn about needs and wants. You know the difference between needs and wants? Needs are the bare essentials. You have to have the needs in order for you to survive. Uh, everything else are like wants. So you need, uh, when you're hungry, that's a need, right? But uh, what you want, I mean, it could be a burger, it could be a pizza, or it could be just um, rice and curry, which is very inexpensive. So, so that's the want, right? So, so that want comes from this discretionary uh, capacity. Uh, when you are in a downturn, uh, you are more focused on the, your needs. You go for your bare essentials and you, you, you cut down on your wants. Uh, if you have noticed, if you have traveled abroad, um, uh, the, if you look at the coffee shops like, let's say, Starbucks, right? So Starbucks is a restaurant, right? So, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's a coffee shop. Um, in, a, in a downward trend, they will suffer. So people will uh, make less visits for these coffee shops. They'll, uh, they'll uh, Yes, they'll, they'll make less visits, so which will adversely affect their uh, business, right? So that is why that they have uh, they have approached these grocery chains, large um, uh, supermarket chains, and sell coffee, branded coffee, uh, Starbucks branded coffee, in those uh, supermarkets. That meaning, uh, in a downturn, uh, the retail business, uh, the, the supermarkets and groceries, that does not um, get cut down. So you ra rather than spending time and, and money on, on visiting a Starbucks and consuming coffee uh, as an end product, you will rather like more t tend to more buy uh, coffee from a grocery, uh, a grocery chain and then consume it at home, things like that. So, uh, uh, so if you if you attempt uh, if you tackle you can uh, through tactical measures you can you know um, reduce or mitigate the impact. Uh, that you that you get uh, during one of these downturns. All right. According to, to statistics, and, and this is very widely known, uh, and this is very widely spoken about, around 60% of American eateries uh, close or change ownership uh, within the first three years. I mean, that's huge. I mean, if you think about it, just imagine so, so the, all the customer pool that we have at Cake. Um, those sixty percent of those customers will either shut down or pass pass the baton to like to some other ownership. That's that's huge, right? That means that there's there's so much 
attrition that's happening. The same applies for uh, Cisco Corporation as well because we, we supply food supplies for uh, like the same kind of uh, population. So what is the market opportunity here? I mean, if we can reduce this by uh, like a frac even a fraction, uh, I mean, the, 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 there's, there's, there's potential, you know, economic gain uh, for, for the organization. Uh, how can we do that? By, by uh, helping these uh, establishments to stay in business with providing more information, providing uh, right information at the right time, actionable insights, uh, um, and then a lot can be done. Uh, I think a few of my uh, colleagues who have done sessions uh, in the recent past have actually uh, gone into a lot of depth uh, on these challenges uh, that uh, that restaurants face. Uh, but I'd like to like reiterate a few of them here. Um, like I mentioned, the changing demographics, uh, the millennials and the Gen Z gen generation. Z means uh, those who were born uh, uh, after 1995. Um, so they are joining the cons consumer pool. So their tastes and preferences and their needs, sorry, wants are very different. Um, so restaurants are finding it very challenging to keep up with the with these uh, new generation and new demand. Uh, brand management in the internet age. I mean, social media, the online reviews, online critics. Uh, uh, you name it. I mean, it's 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 a it's a, it's a whole whole different world out there. Uh, a lot of uh, consumers um, and users uh, take these online reviews pretty seriously, um, and uh, so managing that has been a big, big challenge. Uh, a, a simple um, a mistake could, like you know, uh, uh, damage the reputation of a brand, like you know, overnight. Uh, one single, you know, Instagram post or like a like a tweet is, is required for you to get, you know, negative uh, publicity. So managing things is, is is like you know really serious business. Uh, high employee turnover rates. I mean, uh, uh, and and also the low skill labor uh, and the lower productivity. Um, this is a labor intensive uh, industry. This uh, restaurant business. Uh, therefore, there are more 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 unskilled and uh, labor that that's in the workforce, uh, which has some productivity, uh, lower productivity as well. Um, uh, therefore, there, there, there's high turnover rate. So, so there are people coming, like you know, uh, people joining, employees joining, leaving. That that cycle is you know forever happening. Uh, wages are um, rising. Um, uh, at in in certain uh, states, uh, there are minimum wages applied, uh, so you are subject to uh, those meeting those regulatory requirements as well. Uh, remember the invisible hand that I mentioned. So that invisible hand only applies uh, for a free market, without any government intervention. So minimum wage means there is a government or state in intervention. Um, uh, similar to our fuel prices, or similar uh, similar to our uh, milk milk packet prices, like so, those are um, controlled by the government, right? Um, food food cost in inflation. These are like you know, uh, it happens. Uh, you, uh, you you are subject to uh, the uh, the inflation that's happening in your supplies. Uh, adoption of technology is a, is a challenge. We know that for a fact because we uh, we deal with a lot of customers and. Uh, their, their technical, sometimes capabilities are at a, at a lower level. Um, uh, rising capital expenditure and uh, operating expenditure, uh, all this translates into very thin uh, margins, profit margins. So roughly we are talking about an average about two to five. Um, it's, it's, it's very thin, right? So we we are working with with a with a in an industry with very thin profit margins. So we need to like keep that in mind. So when we apprise our products, um, uh, when we come up with features, so we, we need to we need to keep this in mind and we need to make sure that 
we help them we help uh, increase this uh, from 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 what they what they what they get um, a quick change of gears um, I recently read a book called uh, The Loyalty Effect. So this is a concept that I that I actually, uh, that I borrowed from this book. Uh, often, when you speak about loyalty, uh, you s look at it in, in in terms of customer customer loyalty. I mean, you you just um, look up loyalty and you uh, you'll get bombarded with uh, about customer loyalty. But what this book um, says is, uh, after su studying uh, all these. Uh, uh, great companies, great corporations, large corporations. Uh, the loyalty goes a little beyond uh, than customers. So this same loyalty uh, is applicable f uh, for employees as well as investors. Um, I'll, I'll explain why, why I, I brought this up. Um, so According to their studies, uh, most organizations uh, lose about 50% of their customers every five years. 50% of their employees in every four years. 50% of investors in less than one year. Right? So, so this is applicable for most organizations, may not be applicable for every organization, but uh, this is largely uh, uh, like pretty pretty true. Uh, what the point that they are trying to make is this: this loyalty stunts company growth by 25 to 50 percent. And they go into saying that a five percent increase in customer retention results in doubling of the profit margin. Just read it again. A 5% increase in customer retention results in doubling of the profit margin. So if you can retain 5% of your customers from um, leaving you, you can double your profit. That book goes into depth into explaining why this is actually, um, I, I believe it, it makes a, a pretty, uh, uh, pretty good sense. Uh, when you when you think about it, because it, it you you reduce a lot of uh, operating expenditure, money spent on like you know onboarding people, uh, all sorts of things. What's the market opportunity? I briefly mentioned touched upon this one. Making the products and solutions and services that are resilient to economic cycles. So like we discussed, I mean, the, if we can uh, build solutions, uh, create uh, products and provide services that are resilient and, and keeping in mind this, this larger uh, economic uh, uh, situations, uh, then we can, you know, uh, then, then we can do better in, the, in, in these markets. We need, we need to address core needs, maybe not, maybe not the wants. Of course, of course we can address the wants, but if we address the, the most essential needs with our services and products, Rest assured, we, we can stay in business no matter what happens. Pricing, of course, and this is key, value creation uh, before profit maximizing. Focus should be put on value creation, creating value for the customer. It could be from Cisco Labs point of view, unless we can create, un unless we are creating value for our customer, there's no incentive for them to like to continue doing business, right? So especially in a downturn, they'll say, okay, why, why, why am I continuing with this product? This is not adding any value to me, right? Uh, so it could be anything, it could be cake products, it could be all the, the, the solutions that, uh, that CX provides, it could be the MySysco delivery, the, the mobile app that we have, it could be MySysco shopping, the mobile app and the web, um, uh, MySysco reporting, it could be anything, right? So, so we need to be mindful about this need, this value creation. There has to be an element of value creation in, in whatever we do. And of course, we can always be in sync with what's, what are the, the, the pressing challenges that's happening in the restaurant industry at large. 
and uh, addressing those uh, in whatever we do, in whatever way that we can. Uh, so, in closing, uh, so it's about the, the fundamental mission of a business should be uh, uh, is, is should be value creation, uh, not profit. Uh, if you create value, then it automatically translates to, to profit. Uh, if you start maximizing your profits uh, and, and solely focus on profits, uh, of course you will lose on the value creation part, and you'll you'll get you know kicked out from the market. Um, that's my closing thought. Um, thank you very much.